I guess we'll go ahead and, ahead and get started this morning um, or this afternoon or late at night, depending on where you're at in the world. Um, to, today's session of Humanistic Judaism 101 is on the subject of Shabbat. And so to give you a little bit of a roadmap of what to expect in today's lesson, uh, our conversation today, I wanted to share a little bit, just kind of a little bit of an outline of what we'll be doing, doing that first before we, we delve into the, the heart of things. I do, before we do that, I do want to mention just a few housekeeping things, just a reminder that when you're not talking to Please Mute, just help us uh, reduce background noise. And also just a reminder that uh, if you're doing the assignments for the class, which is wonderful, we're getting several from different people on email, uh, that's great. Keep sending them. But don't stress if you're running late on getting them in or you, you can't get them in right away. That's not a problem. This is this is a class we we anticipate it's going to be kind of self-paced. We're coming at this in different places. Some of us are watching recordings versus live and all of that. So um, but we do appreciate the folks who have sent in assignments so far. So anyway, for today's uh, discussion, we're first we're going to be mostly focusing today on two big questions, and that is why Shabbat? and how to do Shabbat. And as we'll be exploring, there is not a single answer to either of those questions. These questions are ones that expand and have lots of possibilities. So for the question of why Shabbat, we'll first look at a few texts from the Hebrew scriptures. We'll then briefly discuss the wealth of writing on the topic of Shabbat in the Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmuds, the Mishnah, and many other writings. We will not have time to look at them, unfortunately. We'd love, there's a lot there. It'd be really interesting. But unfortunately, in this kind of big picture approach, we have to keep it moving. After that, we're, we're going to be looking at a few excerpts from the writings of Abraham Joshua Heschel from his book, Shabbat. And if oh. any book in, say, the last hundred years or so on Shabbat, I think his book is probably one of the most significant, particularly how he frames Shabbat. And then finally, we'll look at a short video from Tiffany Schlein, who's the author of the book 24-6, which is about the concept of Tech Shabbat. So after that, we'll break into some discussion breakout groups for a bit. And then after that, we'll come back, do a little bit of recap of that section, and then we'll move into the next part is the question of how to Shabbat. And we're going to talk about as humanistic Jews, we have a bit of a choose-your-own-adventure approach to Shabbat. We get to pick. And so I'm going to today explore, we're, we're, or all of us together are going to explore four different paths of Shabbat, which are traditional, adapted traditional, progressive, and non-observant, and talk about all four of these and how these are choices that humanistic Jews make and why, and talk about also how do you do this. And then I'm hoping after that have a little time to talk about what our own experiences of Shabbat have been along the way. So... Let's get started on the question of why Shabbat. And so I'm going to share screen for this part. Let me get the link ready. One of our readings. First, our readings is out of Exodus chapter 20. And it starts in verse 8 and goes down to, let's see. Verse 11. So would there be someone who would like to read it in, in, in English, uh, this passage? If you do, just unmute yourself. Okay, well, I'll read it then. <laughs> oh, go, go for it. Yeah. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of your God, your day, Vav -Hey. You shall not do any work, you, your son or daughter, your male or female slave, or your cattle, or the stranger who is within your settlements. And then one more verse. For in six days your day, Vav -Hey made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them, and then rested on the seventh day. Therefore your day, Vav -Hey, Bless the seventh day and held it. Okay, so that's the first of our of our that's our Exodus text, and we have a lot of folks joining us all at once. Wonderful. Um, our second text is from Deuteronomy, and just a reminder: you looking at Torah as a whole, how it is structured is the Genesis has, of course, the great narratives, the primeval narratives, bringing up to 
the Israel, the, well, actually the point of the Hebrews being in, being in Egypt. Exodus begins the story of the Exodus. The next few books are a mix of some some narrative, also a lot of giving of law. And then Deuteronomy, in some ways, arguably, is a recap. It's where Moses is reminding the Israelites, uh, the Hebrews, of all their obligations before they go into th their promised land. And so a lot of times when I'm reading a, these parallel texts where you have Exodus and Deuteronomy, think of to me, I think of Deuteronomy as kind of a recap or a, another telling. So for that text, let me pull it up real quick. Actually, you know what? I had it one screen back. Here we go. So for the Deuteronomy text, um, back up a little bit. Okay, so starting in verse 12, who would like to read from this? I'll go ahead. <clears throat> Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as your God Adonai has commanded you. Uh, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of your God Adonai. You shall not do any work, you, your son, or your daughter, your male or female slave, your ox or your ass, or any of your cattle, or the stranger in your settlements, so that your male and female slave may rest as you do. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and your God Adonai freed you from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, your God Adonai has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Okay, so looking at these two texts, just for a couple of minutes, what are some of the things that jump out at you about the question of why Shabbat? Well, there's obviously a connection here to the Exodus. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's intended to be set aside as a day of remembrance. Mm -hmm. Now, did we notice, did you notice any mention of the creation story? The seventh day of creation. Yes, it's about God. It's, mm -hmm. well, it does hark back to the creation. Sorry, which is God, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is there, but it's interesting. They don't focus as much on the creation story here. It's much more about just the fact it's commanded, that you do it because it's commanded, not you do it to emulate what God, God did. Are there any other elements that surprise you in these texts? Something that, one of the questions I, I would say is, who is required to do Shabbat in these texts? The um, the Israelites as well as the um, their slaves. Yes. So this is there. This is an important thing because, and bear in mind, we are dealing with an ancient text when slavery was a part of their world. Um, and I would say one of the problems, obvious problems in this text, is that we do not see often as direct of condemnations of slavery as we'd like it to be. There's a lot of sideways attacks on slavery. And of course, the Exodus story itself arguably is such a story, but nonetheless, there's an acknowledgement even now that the Hebrew people themselves have slaves or aspire to have them when they get to the land. Nevertheless, there's a corrective here. Everybody gets a day off, even enslaved people. Now, for our modern ears, that seems kind of insufficient, obviously. I mean, to me, attacking the institution of slavery itself would be more to the point of the matter. But I think read in its context, I think I do think that this is showing at least a, the, some, the beginnings of more humane approaches. Okay, so those are, those are the two big texts. There's many other texts we could have talked about today in Tanakh, uh, but I wanted to, to, to use these two because they are the primary texts we're dealing with. The one thing that jumps out of out at us in looking at Shabbat and some of the other texts is we do not we're not given a great deal of instruction on how to do Shabbat. Um, there's mention of not doing work. There's mention of a few other things, but much of it had to be elaborated through tradition, and that's where 
the Talmud comes into play, that, that level of rabbinic interpretation of making sense of it, but also, frankly, elaborating on it, fleshing it out more. The, uh, the early rabbis, they, they were gifted in the art of stretching a text to make it say more than it once did, to cover new circumstances. And so that's what they, they did with it. And so Shabbat came to evolve and become more and more and more. But for our purposes, I wanted to next jump to the writings of Abraham Joshua Heschel um, for, um, for a little bit more of the why and some other approaches that are, I think, are kind of embedded in the biblical text, but aren't obviously there. So let me share screen again. Let me pull up this text here. So this is um this is actually I'm using my public libraries uh I, I found the book on uh, on our public library website so that's what I'm reading from today. So I'm going to read a little bit then I may ask some others to read as well. But starting with Judaism Judaism is a religion of time aiming at the sanctification of time unlike the space-minded man to whom time is unvaried, iterative, homogeneous to whom all hours are alike, qualitless empty shells. The Bible senses the diversified character of time. There are no two hours alike. Every hour is unique, and the only one given at the moment exclusive and endlessly precious. Judaism teaches us to be attached to holiness in time, to be attached to sacred events, to learn how to consecrate, consecrate sanctuaries that emerge from the magnificent stream of a year. The Sabbaths, are our great cathedrals, and our Holy of Holies is a shrine that neither the Romans nor the Germans were able to burn, a shrine that even apostasy cannot easily obliterate, the Day of Atonement. According to the ancient rabbis, it is not the observance of the Day of Atonement, but the day itself, the essence of the day, which with man's repentance atones for the sins of man. Would someone like to read starting with maybe the next two paragraphs starting with Jewish ritual? I'll do it. Thank you. Jewish ritual may be characterized as the art of significant forms in time as architecture of time. Most of its observances, the Sabbath, the new moon, the festivals, the sabbatical, and the jubilee year depend on a certain hour of the day or season of the year. It is, for example, the evening, morning, or afternoon that brings with it the call to prayer. The main themes of faith lie in the realm of time. We remember the day of the exodus from Egypt, the day when Israel stood at Sinai, and our messianic hope is the expectation of a day of the end of days. In a well-composed work of art, an idea of outstanding importance is not introduced haphazardly, but like a king at an official ceremony, it is presented at a moment in, and in a way that will bring to light its authority and leadership. In the Bible, words are employed with exquisite care, particularly those which, like pillars of fire, lead the way in the far-flung system of the biblical word of meaning, biblical world of meaning. Thank you. One of the most distinguished words in the Bible is the word kadosh, holy a word which more than any other is representative of the mystery and majesty of the divine. Now, what was the first holy object in the history of the world? Was it a mountain? Was it an altar? Uh, I can't read that top line there. Uh, something occasion at which the distinguished word kadosh is used for the first time. In the book of Genesis, at the end, end of the story of creation, how extremely significant is the fact that it is applied to time, and God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. There is no reference in the, in the record of creation to any object in space that would be endowed with the quality of holiness. This is a radical departure from accustomed religious thinking. The mythical mind would expect that, after heaven and earth have been established, God would create a holy place, a holy mountain or, ho or a holy spring, whereupon a sanctuary is to be established. Yet it seems as if to the Bible is holiness in time, the Sabbath, which comes first. Now, I have another text from um, 
Abraham Joshua Heschel can read for a moment, but I'm, I turned off the screen share so y'all don't have to see me flipping through the screens, through the screens, <laughs> the pages. It can be a little bit dizziness inducing. But anyway, at this point in the text, and this is um, his writing is just astonishingly good. It's amazing me. From what I understand, he was actually um, had only been speaking English for about eight years when he wrote this. And so the level of I don't know, just very beautiful prose, and I'm just kind of amazed again that uh, that he was a second language learner and was writing at this level. It's just mind blowing. Um, but throughout this this part of his book, he's talking about the idea that that uh, Shabbat is primarily about enshrining time, making time spe special, and he argues that six days of the week we primarily live in the world of space, in the world of things, in the world of doing. But Shabbat, we're entering into a different different thing, which is time itself, and that becomes the focus. Okay, so I want to go ahead and sh share a screen. This next reading of his is also really powerful, and I think has a lot to say for us today. Um, okay, there we go. I'm trying to get the, uh, the, the Zoom thing is kind of in the way where the text is, so let me move it. Okay, there we go. So would someone like to read, let's say, the first uh, two paragraphs here? I'll go ahead. <clears throat> Beyond civilization, technical civilization is the product of labor, of man's exertion of power for the sake of gain, for the sake of producing goods. It begins when man, dissatisfied with what is available in nature, becomes engaged in a struggle with the forces of nature in order to enhance his safety and to increase his comfort. To use the language of the Bible, the task of civilization is to subdue the earth, to have dominion over the beast. How proud we often are of our victories in the war with nature, proud of the multitude of instruments we have succeeded in inventing, of the abundance of commodities we have been able to produce. Yet in our victories, <clears throat> Excuse me. Yet our victories have come to resemble defeats. In despite of our triumphs, we have fallen victims to the work of our hands. It is as if the forces we have conquered have conquered us. Is our civilization a way to disaster, as many of us are prone to believe? Is civilization essentially evil to be rejected and condemned? The faith of the Jew is not a way out of this world, but a way of being within and above this world. Not to reject, but to surpass civilization. The Sabbath is the day in which we learn the art of surpassing civilization. Adam was placed in the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it, Genesis 2.15. Labor is not only the destiny of man, it is endowed with divine dignity. However, after he ate of the tree of knowledge, he was condemned to toil, not only to labor, Quote, in toil shall thou eat all the days of thy life, unquote, from Genesis 3.17. Labor is a blessing. Toil is the misery of man. The Sabbath as a day of abstaining from work is not a deprecation or depreciation, but an affirmation of labor, a divine exaltation of its dignity. Thou shalt ex ex abstain from labor on the seventh day as a sequel to the command. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Who would like to read these next couple of paragraphs? Be starting where the yellow highlighting starts up at the end. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is Sabbath unto the Lord thy God. Just as we are commanded to meet this, uh, keep the Sabbath, we are commanded to labor. Love work. The duty to work for six days is just as much a part of God's covenant with man as the duty to abstain from work on the seventh day. To set apart one day a week for freedom, a day on which we would not use the instruments which have been so easily turned into weapons of destruction, a day for being with ourselves, a day of detachment from the vulgar, of independence of external obligations, a day on which we stop worshipping the idols of technical civilization. A day on which we use no money, a day of armistice in the economic struggle with our fellow man and the forces of nature. Is there any institution that holds out a greater hope for man's progress than the Sabbath? The solution of mankind's most vexing problem will not problem will not be found in renouncing technical civilization, but in attaining some degree of independence of it. 
In regard to external gifts, to outward possessions, there is only one proper attitude, to have them and to be able to do without them. On the Sabbath, we live, as it were, independent of technical civilization. We abstain primarily from any activity that aims at remaking or reshaping the things of space. Man's royal privilege to conquer nature is suspended on the Sabbath day. What are the kinds of labor not to be done on the Sabbath? They are, according to the ancient rabbis, all those acts which were necessary for the construction and furnishing of the sanctuary in the desert. The Sabbath itself is a sanctuary which we build, a sanctuary in time. It is one thing to race to be driven by the vicissitudes that menace life, and another thing to stand still and to embrace the presence of an eternal of, of an eternal moment. The seventh day is the armistice and man's cruel struggle for existence, a truce in all conflicts, personal and social, peace between man and man, man and nature, peace within man, a day in which handling money is considered a desecration in which man avows his independence of that which is the world's chief idol. The seventh day is the exodus from tension, the liberation of man from his own muddiness, the liberation of man as a sovereign in the world of time. In the tempestuous ocean of time and twirl, there are islands of stillness where man may enter a harbor and reclaim his dignity. The island is the seventh day, the Sabbath, a day of detachment from things, instruments, and practical affairs, as well as of attachment to the spirit. And that was Abraham Joshua Heschel. Um, really, I just love the way he writes and expresses this. Uh, really powerful stuff. So the last thing we're going to do before we move into some discussion time is we have a short I have a short video. And this is from uh, Tiffany Sh uh, Schlein, who's the author of the book 24 six that discusses the idea of tech Shabbat. And I thought this was just kind of in interesting how this was framed. It was it's a video where they have some other folks talking to it. It's just I think it's like two or three minutes. It's pretty short. But let me get this queued up real quick. OK. Shares? Oh, not yet. Not yet. Sorry, I hit the wrong button there. Okay. Got it queued up on that side. Let's hit share screen and remember to share sound, which is always the tricky thing on this. Okay, here we go. <laughs> a lot of anxiety about turning off your phone. I mean, I personally love technology. I founded the Webby Awards in my 20s. I've spent my whole career thinking about the possibilities of technology, but also looking at how it affects us. So I asked some good people, what would it look like to you to turn off screens for a whole day? I don't want to miss a DM for 24 hours. And I really am the kind of person, a legit, legit, I'm the kind of person, if somebody texts me, I will text back. It's so rare I don't text someone back. My mom, the infamous, the queen, um, she likes to know where I am. That would definitely be the most stressful thing. I don't know what it would be like to, to just like throw my phone in a drawer for 24 hours and walk away. And so around 11 years ago, um, my family and I started turning off all screens one day a week on our tech Shabbat and it completely transformed our lives. I would love to turn my phone off for more than 24 hours. I get a little panicky that someone will need answers from me that I, that I can't provide or that someone will make decisions without me being involved. I think I'm just making up excuses. I just like Instagram. I think Shabbat is about setting aside distractions and not doom scrolling. It's about being present and being aware and being grateful for the moment that we're in and observing that and appreciating that before moving on to the next thing. There's this there's tool, this thousands of year old tool called Shabbat that is going to help you with this world that we live in because it's almost like technology has kind of gotten ahead of us and it makes it so we never can take a break. And here's this ritual that allows you each week to take a break. I definitely would love to implement turning off my phone for a full rest day for all of Shabbat, take a breath and allowing ourselves, allowing myself space. Trust that it will all be there when we get back to it. There's like all this FOMO, uh, but most of it is an illusion. It's just one day a week, but it is the rest and renewal that I need to be the best I can be for the rest of the week. So the best thing about Shabbat and taking a tech Shabbat is that every week is a new chance to try it. But I think 
think it's a really good challenge. Maybe I should try. So count me in. So you win. Okay, let me turn that off, so. All right, trying to get back to the right. There we are. Okay. So anyway, uh, we've heard so far, we've heard uh, a bit of scripture. We've heard the discussion about all of the interpretation over the years, and by the way, just to give you an idea of how much of that Talmudic interpretation is there, there are several tractates just on Shabbat itself. So there's a lot there. If we ever do an advanced version of this class, uh, we may go back and look at some of that. But we heard from Abraham Joshua Heschel. We heard from Tiffany Schlein. Now it's time for us to go to our breakout groups and for us to engage with this, the question of why Shabbat. And by the way, the answer could be, no, I don't want Shabbat. That's fine. The The issue is why. This is kind of the whole point of this whole class is what practices we choose to do, what practices we choose not to do. We want to make them intentionally. So the questions for a breakout time are, what did you think of the reasons we've heard for, from, for Shabbat? From the Bible, from Heschel, from Shlain. Uh, what do we think of these reasons? And are these reasons compelling to us or not? And lastly, I'm going to ask, are these rationales compatible with humanistic Judaism? Um, this morning, in fact, it hit me, and it actually, as we were, we were watching the video today, I realized I left out one really important voice, and that is, I'm now wishing I'd gone and found some writings from Rabbi Sherwin Wine, or someone more recent, who, specifically who's humanistic and how they approached it. Since we didn't, we as the class, we have to answer that question. What is, what is a humanistic argument for Shabbat? or not. So anyway, I want to break, we'll do the breakout rooms for about 10 minutes, and I'll put the questions in the chat. I will be jumping from class, from session to session, partly because I need to go back to the main room to let people in, but also just kind of see how things are going. But we'll go for about 10 minutes. So let me go and put the questions in the chat again, and then we'll go ahead and do the breakout rooms. And also just a reminder, just so you'll know, the breakout rooms are not recorded, so uh, feel free to be say whatever you want. Um, it's not recorded there. So, okay, breakout rooms. We'll do. I think we'll do three. Yeah. Okay, everyone. Um, let's go ahead and share just a little bit from each of the groups. So, for the first group. Um, I should have written down who is who, but uh, would one of the groups like to share a little bit about what you discussed? Well, um, before um, like I share any thoughts on my own or, or invite anybody who spoke in our group to share some of their thoughts, um, Casey, you didn't get a chance to mention anything. I just wanted to check and see if, the, if, if uh, there were any thoughts that you wanted to share. Oh, no, it's okay. I agree with everything you said. Okay. Well, um, I just wanted to, uh, to to give a chance for you to to have that opportunity just in case. Um, and since my mic's on, um, I'm going to go ahead. Uh, no, I, I appreciate oh. that. I, yeah, I just. Yeah, I, my, my signal's pretty bad, so please do not feel <laughs> bad. Thank you, though. Casey okay. had mentioned earlier in the chat that it was in the car for the next few hours and kind of yeah. in and out. So yeah, um, thank you for that link in the chat, Heather. I'm I'm anxious to look at that. Um, Sherwin Wine's commentary on Shabbat, the significance of Shabbat. Um, uh, you know, I've uh, since I've got my mic on already. I'm just I'm I'm going to go ahead and be selfish and share um, quickly the uh, the thoughts that I had, which was that. Uh, I'll share this specifically that when listening to the the writings of Heschel, I I, I enjoyed them quite a bit. About uh, particularly, you know, I've said to the group before. I said in the breakout room that I'm I'm a leftist. I'm a socialist and anti-capitalist. So uh, I see Shabbat as a revolutionary act as well because it gives us an opportunity to to stop. Um, 
and not participate um, not only in in you know the the theft of our surplus uh, labor value, but also in the consumption of uh, that's you know that's so that's such a big part of late stage capitalism, and um, and so it, it gives us a chance to resist um, uh, you know if we want if we want to take that uh, once a week, um, and then. Uh, I also, however, had a, uh, uh, an issue with Heschel, where he talks about um, the phrasing phrasing he uses is that we um, it gives us a chance to be in civilization, but above it um, to surpass civilization. And as a humanist, I don't really like that um, concept. That sounds more like language I was used to in in uh, you know the theist traditions um, that I was part of. Uh, where they would say be in the world but not of it um uh as a humanist no i want to be in the world and i do want to be of the world and i want to help make the world a better place i want to be in you know i want to be in the forest amongst the trees not above the forest um or trying to you know avoid the forest um and so i just maybe heschel didn't mean what i'm taking it to to mean but that that um, that language kind of ruffled my feathers a little bit. And then um, something that uh, um, that was uh, shared by Heather, um, where the significance of, you know, that each individual has to kind of uh, find their, their own way to, to do Shabbat. And, and Gabrielle talked about it as well, about, about the need for rest. Um, uh, one of the Unitarian Universalist ministers um, at a local church that I've attended here uh, just recently went on sabbatical, and she, her last sermon before she went on sabbatical was was entitled "Rest." I was in, talking, of course, about the importance of rest. And when Gabrielle and Heather were talking about this, it made me think. I think as human beings, we've kind of always innately known that inevitably we need a break. In America, and I don't know about Australia or England or any any other place in the world. It's really in vogue right now to talk about mindfulness and do things like meditation and yoga and things like that um, as and self care. That language is very popular, um, and I think that we've just always innately known we need rest and we need to take care of ourselves. And and this was just the way that the that uh, the 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 writers of of these texts. Uh, kind of enshrined it themselves. So um, yeah, I'll go ahead and mute myself now. That was long enough. <laughs> Thank you, Skip. What are other, what, what, what are thoughts from other groups? Well, um, our conversation was kicked off by the notion of dominion over nature and like how to step down from that. But we also talked about, um, how hard it is to step away from your tech in this society. Mm -hmm. Like stepping away from your tech is something that takes actual working on yourself and finding and like working on finding alternatives to using tech. So we talked a lot about that and I, I would just like to add that, um, in this society, we do tend to walk all over the planet like we own the place. And I think we've found that that doesn't work. So maybe we need more than one day a week to step down from that. Thank you. But Any other thoughts from the breakout groups who'd like to share? We we talked about the health health the psychological health aspects of it a lot. We felt that that really was a major um, incentive, really, and, and also that we can't always do it on Saturday. You know, we're on the tr traditional Shabbat. Some people's jobs are that day or whatever, and so we were saying as humanists, we're very lucky we can make any day you know the sabbath so we talked about that and what else did we talk about um help me out here someone Phyllis or adam 
Uh, with Janet and also Janet. Oh, go ahead, Adam. I can't think of oh. anything. To say. I, oh, think, uh, I, I think you've summarized um, pretty well. Yeah. Um, I, I work on Saturdays and Sundays. And so um, after listening to Phy Phyllis said um, quite rightly, well, it doesn't need to be. Um, it doesn't need to be um, Saturday. So I think my, my Sabbath's going to be Mondays from now on. Great. Uh, and we didn't hear it from, uh, from Janet. So did you oh, yeah. that, Janet? Yeah. Oh, hi. I was just going to say that um, I, um, I read Hetchel's book when I was in college, and I did love his book. Um, but... It also, my life was actually way slower, so it was actually easier to do some of the ideas that he suggested. Um, now it's just way too hard. And also it doesn't, I think I'm neurodiverse sort of and ADD-ish, and it just doesn't work for my life to mm -hmm. do that. Um, so I, I know I take rest throughout the week, so I kind of break up the time um, because I can with my work. I have long in, days of work and short days and so that way I can have rest in sections. I do not do well with a whole, and that's one of the things I discovered with trying to keep Sabbath, because I just don't do well with 25 straight hours of doing nothing. I just, it's just too hard for my brain. I'll not use it wisely. I'll use it very unwisely. And I know that other people can do that, but I'm just not one of those people. So I just wanted to suggest that when I really like that fourth version of just making it the way it works for you, and that's how it works best for me is just to break up rest throughout the week. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Well, we'll continue these theme discussing some of these themes the next part, but I want to move now to the practical of how to do Shabbat. And so I thought we'd take a few minutes to talk through, at the beginning we talked about four approaches, traditional, adapted traditional, progressive, and non-observance. So we'll talk about these for just a few minutes, but then after that what I really want to get to is hearing some discussion of our group, of our experiences with Shabbat of late. Um, and certainly if you have older experiences, that's great to bring into the conversation as well. But I'm especially eager to hear from anyone who did our class assignment of trying out Shabbat and hearing what your experiences are. So we're going to have save quite a bit of time for that. But first, let's talk just a little bit about these different approaches. And I'm going these are grossly oversimplified, no way around it. So to begin with, let's talk about tra a traditional observance of Shabbat. And and I'm going to maybe maybe define it more precisely. I'm meaning a halakhically traditional observance of Shabbat, acknowledging there's other traditions, but specifically um, that halakhic framework of Shabbat. What do what do we know about what that looks like? What are some of the things you're al you're allowed to do? What are some things you're not allowed to do in a traditional Shabbat? Let's uh, just uh, Unmute yourselves and throw out a few possibilities, and then we'll talk about it for a little bit. I guess it depends on which tradition you're talking about. But my understanding is is that, like in some traditions, you can't even use light switches. And um, my my refrigerator, um, uh, they have a model that's similar to mine that has a uh, has a Sabbath mode that you can turn it on. And, you know, every every um, Friday evening until Saturday evening, it I don't know exactly the details, but it operates differently. And I'm assuming it, you know, doesn't use electricity or something. That one's a very interesting one. My understanding is specifically about the kindling of lights. And so I think what that means is, is that the refrigerator still stays cold, but the lights don't go on and off. So the, the, that's have right. a dark yeah. fridge, I believe. Yeah, that's I, right. I remember now. I do know in Israel and a few other parts of the world, there are Sabbath elevators that when they're running on Sabbath mode, what they do is they open the doors, you walk in, go to the next floor, opens it just automatically. So you, you none of the buttons work. You don't push the buttons at all. It just stops one floor at a time and you just have to wait for every many floors it is because you can't touch the buttons. Um. I know other traditional traditions um, in some communities, there's a prohibition of tearing things. And so toilet paper often before sh Shabbat starts is torn off um, in pieces so that you have toilet paper to use and you won't be tearing toilet paper on Shabbat. Um, no writing. Right. Oh, correct. Yes. 
Mark, you yeah. want to say more about that? Go ahead. I, I, I said it exact same time as you did, but yeah, <laughs> you, you can't write. <laughs> um, mm. And that's part that's partly because of um, the uh, creation. You can't you can't do melacha, which is work which creates. So I would doing, assume that would also forbid uh, most, would that for, forbid art generally? Yeah. Yeah. I lived in a community where we couldn't even walk certain distances. So I had to live like right across the street from the synagogue because I couldn't walk, you know, within so many, I had to be within so many miles of the synagogue in order to go to services on Shabbat. I live and in then, the Arab. Yeah. Yeah, and then the, the women average. could not push baby carriages. So that's why the, most of the women did not go to the shul, because if they had children, they couldn't push a baby carriage. It was considered work. Yeah. Martin, could you explain more about what the era is? I think that's a really interesting aspect of this. Yeah, yeah because in the Torah, when um, the Israelites first were given, however you want to frame it, this um, commandment, uh, it says that you can't go out of the confines of your settlement. Um, so that means in orthodox practice that you uh, can't go outside of your neighborhood, basically. So where I live and in many orthodox, um, in, in many orthodox communities throughout the world, there is a wire, basically, like a telephone wire kind of thing that goes around your neighborhood. It sets the boundary of your Arab, which means like your your quarter um and you you can carry within that but you can't carry anything outside of that yeah do i understand right it's about the public private spaces that the the era of basically extends yeah. the boundary of what is a public and versus a private space yeah i mean it's basically um within your neighborhood kind of considered to be semi-private i believe you know, most Oh, go ahead, Adam. I believe most of Manhattan is encompassed in a single Eruv. Yeah, I had heard that as well, actually. Of, in a very big chunk of Los Angeles is. In the U.S., of course, it's raised some interesting legal questions because of our separation of church and state and putting wires like this on utility poles and all the government. It's, it's a very complicated legal question of whether generally what's happened in most places is that, that the the organization that sponsored the era of construction and whatnot is actually basically had to contract with the city to have permission to do this wiring, but it's uh, it has to be illegal. Like they have to pay money for it because otherwise, if if you allowed this to be support of one religion over another, so it gets in some very interesting stuff. You know, positively, you know, thinking about these tradition this traditional approach, and I think it's very easy for many of us who are more on the progressive the side to only see the problems and they're real and I'm I'm not we just don't have time to go into them today but I do just in passing mention there's also some very positive aspects of some of these traditions the idea of the era of what to me I find interesting is it is a way of cementing community and neighborliness within a certain area if you're limited on where you can go to socialize and whatnot you're going to stay in your neighborhood and I could see some real positives of that uh, some of the other practices, the intense uh, mindfulness of being thoughtful about things, I can see positives. And so I guess I'm trying to say is in presenting this, I don't want to present it as look at these people. They do weird stuff and let's make fun of them. That's that's not my intent at all. Um, I will say myself, not that's not my approach, but I will really want to express here appreciation. And Martin, did you raise your hand? Yeah, I just want to say some, say some, another positive thing for for um you're supposed to have sex on shabbat so mm -hmm. if you're married or you can re reconstruct that as in a relationship um or, or however you want to reconstruct it <laughs> uh in a sex positive way that's quite a good thing that you're a commandment that you're supposed to do on shabbat absolutely and, a lot, and interestingly a lot <laughs> of people that are non non-jewish think that it's not the case they think that you're not allowed to <laughs> <laughs> But I think that's a really positive. I do uh, too. Yeah. I, I definitely do. So the next approach we're going to look at very briefly is adapted traditional approach to Shabbat. And what I specifically mean by this is um, in the conservative movement in the U.S., and I don't know if this is the case in other parts of the world, but in the, in the U.S., 
there is there was a really um, a major moment in the conservative movement, and that was when they issued a response saying that they believed that there was a halakhic argument to allow driving to shul on Shabbat. And the issue was that Jews during the 1950s, many of them were moving away from the from the neighborhoods. So they they, you know, 50, 50 years before that, early 1900s, most Jews lived often in small neighborhoods where everyone was close together. Walking to shul, if that was the rule, no biggie, because that's how you got around if you lived in the big cities. But in suburb in suburbia, and by this point by the 1950s, more of the conservative movement lived in suburbia than they did in the big cities. The issue was that people were, if the choice was I can drive to, sh to shul or not go to shul, they'd just stay home. And so there began some questioning. And what the conservative movement did was go through a very traditional approach to reaching the conclusion of saying we're going to interpret the rules now to say you can drive to shul. And over time, that has continued to evolve in other ways. What I find really interesting about that aspect of it, though, is, is that it, this is still a framework that says you need to have a halakhically oriented rationalization for what you're doing. In other words, this isn't free for all. You do whatever you want. It is saying that we are willing to re-examine the traditions, but see them in new lights and reinterpret them. There's a few things important to say about this, though. First of all, in the conservative movement, my understanding is even before the ruling happened, many people were already driving to shul. So this is one thing about religious evolution. You know, we often focus most of our attention on what's decided on high, but really individual Jews were voting with their feet, or I should say voting with their cars long mm -hmm. before this. And so that's one element of it. The second element I would say, though, and where was, I'm sorry, that lost one of thought. Uh, oh, yes, that not all conservative, even when the rules changed, not all conservative Jews, st st some still interpret it more traditionally. And I'll give an example. One of my favorite rabbis here locally, and I think a few of you actually know him through online stuff, Rabbi Juan Mejia. He's very famous for his work in doing conversions in Latin, Jewish conversions in Latin America. But he's uh, he's a conservative rabbi here in Oklahoma City, and he generally walks everywhere in Shabbat. Um, and I remember uh, a few years back we had a um, a, a bat mitzvah party for one of uh, at my Reform Temple, and his daughter was going to attend, but they walked, and it was about well, half a mile or so. It was a good distance, and it was a very hot day, and many of us kind of worried like. But for him, and I, I never got to talk to him about this, but I'm pretty sure for him he saw this as being that um, my assumption is he interpreted these this, this tradition and said, yes, I am the conservative movement said this is okay, but for X, Y, and Z reason, I'm going to maintain the stricter form of observance. And so this is an example to say that just because a movement says something doesn't mean everybody does something different. Okay, a third approach would be what I would call a progressive approach to Shabbat. And progressive approach to Shabbat would be what, what generally – is advocated by most reform rabbis, many conservative rabbis, humanistic regions, a lot of the progressive side of the Jewish equation. And the argument here is, is that Shabbat is important. Shabbat is a deep part of our values and our tradition. And so we are going to seek to, to dig into that, but not get hung up on the minutia. Um, there's positives and negatives of this. Positively, it allows creative other ways of doing Shabbat. Just as we've had discussion today, someone saying, I can't do Shabbat on Saturday. I can do it on Monday. That is a choice that a progressive interpretation of Shabbat allows. The negative, in my opinion, is as someone who sees a lot of value in Shabbat, is, is I think what unfortunately what has also happened is, is that the majority of Jews, progressive Jews today, do not observe Shabbat at all. And that's a harsh reality, but um, I think there's 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 a bit of truth to it. And so my concern is, is that as someone who does value Shabbat, I am concerned that giving up the traditional adherence has we've lost some of the stickiness of the, of the tradition, the, the things that encourage engagement with the tradition. And so that's my concern about the, the, that that maybe they're not being without intentionality. There's not enough stickiness. Skip, you have your hand up. One thing that I would add to that um, for a lot of people, uh, 
you know, the difficulties of life can uh, make it um, sometimes even burdensome to, to, to stop and do Shabbat, which is unfortunate. Um, you know, I, I suspect that there are many Jews who, you know, would be the only one in their family observing Shabbat. Um, my family has been very supportive of me embracing humanistic Judaism and they've participated in, in the holiday um, rituals and even in Shabbat a number of times, especially my little girl. Um, but most of the time it's just me. And, you know, I'm trying to move past feeling awkward about lighting candles and, and doing, uh, you know, a Kiddush and Hamatzi uh, by myself, but it's, it's a little awkward. And, and I can imagine that, you know, when you're dealing with mixed faith homes or with homes where, you know, it, you, uh, you, you know, it's Jewish and then no other particular faith, it might be, it might be a little more difficult to continue to embrace Shabbat as a, as a tradition on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So now that we've spent some time framing the why we do Shabbat, some of the how, the different approaches people take towards Shabbat, I wanted now to move into some practical conversation of talking about some of our own recent experiences. And so just for the, the sake of kind of tracking the time and whatnot, if you could either raise your hand or wave or something, if you got to do some kind of Shabbat experiment over the last couple of weeks of, of doing Shabbat, um, we have David, uh, who else? Uh, Phyllis, uh, Paul and Betty Ann. Okay, so we have several people. So why don't we, I, I think what we'll do first is for those who got to do that, why, not, why don't you each take a few minutes, if you feel comfortable, sharing what your experience was like. So uh, Phyllis, I, do you want to go first? Okay, so um, I've been traditionally practicing Shabbat for many years, um, almost holopically. So I decided to not do it that way that's very strict, um, and to sort of um, do more of a tech Shabbat, which is hard for me because I'm handicapped, and so it requires me to turn off some things um, and live in silence, which is hard for me because I'm noisy, and I like to talk and listen to music and dance around the house and do strange things, <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, I live by myself, and so it was hard to live in silence. It was really weird for me. Um, mm. But I did enjoy it, oddly enough. I really mm. enjoyed it. I, I got a book out that I hadn't, you know, that I had on the shelf to read for a long time. And I got a glass of wine and I pet the dog and we sat and I turned on the fireplace, you know, and it was nice. It was really nice. I might do that again. <laughs> <You awesome. know? laughs> so. Thank you. I mean, I made a nice meal for myself and I lit candles and the house was quiet and still. And it's amazing when the house is still, you know, to spend time just being still and being quiet and not having my heart racing and jumping all around and being silly all the time. So it was nice. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Who would like to share next? Okay, well. It was similar to our experience. It, it, well, similar, but we, we have our own take. Well, I'm yeah. gluten-free, so we actually made a gluten-free uh, challah, which we ordinarily don't have challah, at least not share it. Betty Ann can eat it, but I couldn't. So I actually made a gluten-free challah, and we did uh, light the candles and have that uh, spr a cranberry spritzer for our wine. And um, uh, we're not... It's hard for us to do the prayer so much, but we did something, said something. And then we, uh, our version of doing Shabbat was to have no news. We, we don't turn off our phones because we read on the phone. So we read all day. We only, we answered texts. It was from family. That was it. You know, with, like visiting family or calling them. We didn't turn on the TV. Uh, it was really nice, quiet. It wasn't as quiet as, as uh, Phyllis because there's two of us. And we discussed things like dancing, uh, which would have put on the stereo or something. But um, uh, mostly we read, basically. Because we, and it was really nice. We and really I, enjoyed the yeah. quiet. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. 
Well, I, I just, and I didn't look at my to-do list. I didn't think about chores, which to me is a real Sabbath. So not think about mm-hmm. everything you, you know, you're, you're putting off and not doing <laughs> for me, but you're not burdened with that. What, what yeah. was your take? No. Yeah. Just, it was just the quiet part because we just didn't turn the TV on at all, all day. And we usually don't except until nighttime. Mm-hmm. But Friday night, we... Well, we, we did watch Jeopardy this did. time because it was a, <laughs> oh, a game. Yes, we yes. played our game. That's we do right. play our, our games. We play the New York Times games. We played that That's on right. Saturday. and we. But we thought we wouldn't do Jeopardy next time. We just wouldn't turn on the TV at all. And uh, But it was just, no. it was, I, I appreciated not, not hearing the noise. And I'm really a TV person and I love movies. And we usually. And we thought we might watch a movie and we decided we wouldn't. We would just, just do the quiet. Yeah. And was, there was the thing was we weren't going to do news. We weren't going to do anything like that. I know. But we then decided that even the TV should be off because it was. It Breaking into nice, the, just yeah. the the quiet time. Mm, thank you, thank you. Well, who would else would like to share? I can go real quick. Sure. Uh, so we're talking about a recent <laughs> experience. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, mine was interesting in that I ended up having to go to the urgent care so I had to break everything so I had to um, go drive to see the urgent care but when that was finished um, I came back so that was a Saturday so I did have to um, say break some traditional rules there but I think it's allowed because you're allowed for life and death situations Um, so Friday nights I typically Light the Shabbat candles. I'll have challah. I will try to limit uh, all my tech, but I will allow for calls, especially from family members. Um, my husband's deployed, so if he calls, I'm absolutely taking that call. <laughs> um, and you know, we try to limit TV. Um, if you know, ideally, not even having it at all. Um, spending time together with family. I have a child. You probably heard her in the background. So um, I think in that way, uh, it's positive because then it gives, you know, more time to spend with our family and friends and loved ones. Thank you. Well, I guess I'll share real quick my experiences of the last two weeks. I decided I've in the, you know, other and during norm, more normal times, I do a little bit of Shabbat observance, but not not nearly as intentionally as I, I wanted to. So I decided to to take this class coming up as an excuse to do a, to do more observance than I have in the past. But still to I'm picking and choosing. I'm, I'll be very upfront about that. So what I avoided was the news and activism and also uh, factory farmed meats, uh, which I'm, I know may seem like an odd set of choices, but for me, activism and news is a big deal because that's that's my life most of the rest of the time. I'm very much involved in peace activism of a lot of different things, and it touches my, my legal work and everything else. Oh, and also not doing legal work. So I said, I won't do legal work on Shabbat. I won't do activism. I won't uh, follow the news. Um, and the first uh, Shabbat that I did this went very well. Uh, ended up being able to stay home all day. And so it was a very restful Shabbat. Um, I did do some things that would not be allowed traditionally, but that I didn't feel really fell into the things I was trying to avoid. So, for instance, I did watch a lot of, of uh, favorite TV shows with my wife uh, and just um, sitting and cuddling and watching TV, which often I wouldn't t- take the time for. But it, you know, this was something to me that did seem conducive to the spirit of Shabbat. Um, and avoiding the news that first time was really easy. And of course, for the for the eating, I I had I uh, can't afford to buy this quality of meat all the time. But for Shabbat, I decided to buy a better quality, locally grown, grass fed meat that has been more ethically produced and whatnot. And that was a really neat experience. 
Um, the second Shabbat was harder. My family was kind of going in different directions. And so I kind of got roped into some of their activities. Also, one of the things I found really challenging was I realized that you really can't engage with social media with the friends I have at all without seeing news headlines. And so I really just I decided I needed to quit checking my email and doing social media even, which what really was I initially thought, oh, that wouldn't be a problem per se if you're looking at funny cat videos or something. But I decided the problem is, is that the funny cat videos are mixed in with news and uh, the news headlines. I just it was nice having a day of not having my blood pressure go up and not being scared about the future. Uh, so I want to keep experimenting with it. So. OK, anyone else would like to share? Martin. Um, I just wanted to say that um, a lot of the progressive views that I know um, in the UK, um, in, including my, including myself, uh, we would very often. So, for example, during 2020, when I was living with two friends, um, because we all kind of decided when the lockdown was announced that it's going to happen that we would all just stay together for the lockdown. Um, we used to um, do the Friday night, um, watch um, something funny, you know, something, a, a genre of uh, movies that we liked. And definitely, I've always not watched the news or anything on Shabbat. Um, and we would go for a walk on Saturday morning. So we would wake up in the morning and we would use leftover salad, um, things from the night before, because I always make too much food. Um, and we would have like a really nice breakfast and then we would go for a walk to the park. Um, and we we actually kind of realized that we don't mind going to a, uh, like a restaurant or a cafe on uh, Shabbat uh, midday. Uh, because we would normally go for a really long walk and end up at this uh, cafe that was at the other end of a park. And we thought, well, we're not, for a start-up, for progressive Jews, it, it, it does, that kind of thing is not really considered breaking Shabbat, you know. Um, but the point of that was that we thought, well, we're not going to spend any money on anything that we wouldn't be using on Shabbat. So if we go to a cafe... Um, we're not making those people work, if you know what I mean. They they they're not they're not Jewish, and they they've already kind of decided that they will serve people. So it's kind of like a, I don't know what I, I kind of lost my train of thought, but it was kind of like uh, going for a nice walk, having a meal in the daytime. It didn't feel like breaking Shabbat. It felt like actually doing Shabbat because it was quite special. Yeah. And normally I wouldn't spend money on Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, if you think about it, just putting it on a credit card, you don't actually spend the money until the bill comes. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I have known people that made arrangements with a local restaurant, paid them in advance, and they uh, basically had a tab running so they could eat on Shabbat, but they didn't handle the money. So. Yeah. <laughs> But I think that a lot of around. progressive Jews do this kind of thing, you know, like I think that for a lot of progressive Jews, uh, <laughs> you, you use the term pick and choose. And I don't think there's anything wrong with picking and choosing. You know, I, just, I agree, but I also grew up hearing that was a bad thing. You should that. No, yeah. I've heard people often in, insult people that pick and choose saying, oh, that's cafeteria Judaism. You pick a little bit of this and a little bit of that and it's all. And I, I, to me, I would argue pick and choose, yes, but I think it's also pick and choose based on Jewish principles. So it's not just purely your own preferences, but I you're think. also basing it for intentional reasons. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, the fact that we're, as humanistic Jews, a lot of us come from not doing much to bringing back in the spiritual aspects of it. So, so we're... You know, it, it doesn't have to follow any particular rules, but but it's following the spiritual rules that we make for ourselves, that mm -hmm. we, we're making it spiritual. Exactly. 
By the way, we had in chat uh, from Liz. I want to read this because I thought it was really good. She says, my, my two roommates are not Jewish, but I've invited them to join in on a few holiday and Shabbat meals when I've been able to make them. We lit the candles, but I didn't say any of the liturgy while they were there because I didn't want to push that on them. One of my roommates is vegan, and their partner is gluten-free, so I made a vegan and gluten-free noodle kugel, which was surprisingly delicious. I really liked that that little thing, uh, in part because Liz was also showing another aspect of Shabbat that I haven't – I don't think it's come up yet in any of the readings, and that is the idea of hospitality. And I think that there's a lot of really – value in bring, using hospi doing hospitality on Shabbat. And I would say one thing I think very positive about the, the traditional approach is, is because the traditional approach is a fair amount of work involved, if you travel, it's often important to find a family you can have Shabbat supper with. And that um, in and I, 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 I like that because there's this idea of even in traveling, it reintegrates you into the tr tradition. But in the same way, I think it could that that idea could be reinterpreted for our times in our context, um, and especially the interfaith elements of it. Uh, Shabbat, a Shabbat, a Shabbat supper is something I've, my family, we've invited people of other faiths to our Shabbat suppers, and it's just a delightful time because people don't have problems with eating and drinking and having good conversation. And if you have a little blessing at the beginning, and maybe that's okay, maybe it won't be depending on your environment, but. Um, for the most part, there's very little religious content to a Shabbat supper. It's it's being in the moment. And Skip, you have your hand up. Um, both you and Martin um, touched on something that I think is worthy of discussing as part of this. Um, <clears throat> oftentimes we talk about uh, the the negative um, uh, um, like practices of of uh, Shabbat um, and and you know, as a Latter-day Saint, the same discussion came up for the Sabbath on Sunday. Um, uh, but, and when I say negative, I don't mean bad. I mean the things that we should not be doing. But, um, you know, there's also the affirmative side of it, uh, the, the things that we should be doing. You talk about hospitality and inviting guests to, you know, have supper with you, ha having dinner with family. Um, and, you know, of course we have also, you know, the lighting, the candles, the wine and the bread, but, you know, there's, I think, um, there's, there are things that, you know, even traditional theistic Jews, uh, look to, uh, as affirmative practices to do on Shabbat, like studying Torah and things like that. Mm-hmm. It, uh, to me, it was funny because I was thinking, okay, uh, how far would I take it? Uh, also because of the news. And uh, to me, we are, in my home, we're a newsaholic. And actually, since I'm my mom's primary caregiver, sometimes, uh, sometimes I, I mind what she's listening to news sometimes 24-7. Uh, sometimes she's listening to something else or, or you know. Uh, but uh, in her case, sometimes too much silence uh, is a sign that she's depressed. And it's, uh, so I was saying, okay, I, I want to be disconnected from the news, but I also, I want to be with her uh, and available and, and not just disengage from her because, I mean, this is, what I'm doing with my life right now, and it's um, those are the needs. Pikuach nefesh, as they say in in Hebrew, no? saving a life, saving a, a, a soul is is uh, one of the better phrases of Jesus. Is Shabbat was for the man and the man for for the Shabbat, uh, mm -hmm. and I always love that one. So yeah, but it's it's interesting because I was saying, okay, if, if I read my big bulky. Um, Hebrew Bible, uh, I will be, uh, it's one thing, but I have to carry it around. If I open Safari, yeah, uh, Safari and, and I'm going to be engaging with text, but it's, it's an, uh, I say, okay, Pikuach Nefesh. But then the thing is where you have to decide, yeah, you have to put an intentionality uh, as of, okay, how many cat videos before uh, some news will. <laughs> will grab your attention and you will get 
pulled by it. It's, it's a bit the same thing. You know? Cat and dogs, please. A bird. Okay. Phyllis and then Martin. I just want to ask a question. I always um thought that Shabbat was supposed to be, or in my the way I practice it, mm. I thought that Shabbat was um an opportunity to rest from whatever my regular work routine or work days were. So for me, as somebody who tends to be a little shy and pushes myself during the week to be out there with people and extending myself in the community and, you know, um, be very involved in community service and community work, I like to use my Shabbat as a time to take care of myself and to sort of pull away from that. Um, I don't enjoy having Shabbat dinners with people. I just don't. <laughs> and as a single person, I've always been invited to a lot of them. I get invited a lot, you know, even as a soldier, I got invited to a lot of single dinner, you know, dinners because people thought I would be alone on Shabbat. And I would graciously go because I was, you know, that person <laughs> who me to have some gratitude and know when people are being kind to you. And so I would go and I'd be gracious. And I was grateful to be there. I was grateful that people thought of me, you know, and they didn't want me to be alone. But it, it was the, the nicest part of having that Shabbat to myself this week was the fact that I didn't have to run around, prepare for Shabbat, clean the house, wash the dishes, you know, put everything away, get everything together, invite a bunch of people over, light the candles, say the prayers. You know, it was because Shabbat to me gets very stressful when I do it the way I'm supposed to do it. It gets very stressful. I mean, I, I get real wrapped up in are the candles on the table? Is, is the tablecloth right? Is the... You know, and it turns into this checklist of things, another checklist of things I'm supposed to do. And so I look forward to having another opportunity where I can shut the door, pull the shades down and just be in here with the dog and sit on the couch, pet the dog and have a glass of wine and light some candles, turn on the fireplace and just read book. And it's mm -hmm. just me and the dog, you know, and it's not me trying to prepare the traditional Shabbat for a whole bunch of people or even another person. I have a, a a uh, friend who loves to come to Shabbat because it's like multiple courses and blah, blah, it's almost Passover, you know, and that takes a lot out of me and I don't mind doing it, but I prefer to do what I did last week. Just saying. Sure. <laughs> Martin and then Paula and Betty Ann. I was actually about to say that um, uh, Shabbat was uh, you know the verse Vayina Fash. Um Shavat Vayina Fash, uh to rest and to rejuvenate, basically to so this it even says that God rested and rejuvenated. Nefesh means the soul, so it's like rejuvenating your soul. So actually like a lot of what people are saying, what Phyllis just said, it, it falls under that category of Vayina Fash. And I think people forget very often that part of Shabbat is you know, to to sit back and to rejuvenate yourself. Um, and we're all like very often thinking that we have to do things for other people, like rightly so, you know, we, sh we should look after each other. But on Shabbat is actually an opportunity to look after yourself. And um, about the comments that, um, a lot of the comments that people are making about their own personal circumstances and the things, you know, that um, if they were to observe observe Shabbat in the traditional way, it would cause them stress and anxiety and, you know, Gab Gabrielle's mother, things like this. Um, the link that I posted in the chat a few minutes ago from Rabbi Joseph Dweck um, in the, the UK Sephardi chief rabbi, uh, he discusses mental health and Shabbat in that, in that talk. And they actually come up with circumstances where, for example, um, if somebody can't stand silent and they need music, uplifting music or whatever, he actually says that it's coming from an orthodox framework, Sephardi framework, that you can set your radio to just play on your favorite channel and then turning up and up, turning the volume up and down isn't switching it on and off. So you're not breaking <laughs> Shabbat. 
and 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 no, I mean it sounds funny, but it's actually really important because yeah. um, he said that that is Pekuach Nefesh, the person with that particular mental health issue needs to hear music, and so it's quite the opposite of breaking Shabbat to listen to music for them on Shabbat. Thank you, thank you. Okay. We have, oh, distracted by a deer in our backyard. Oh, it was eating from a bush so that the animals were beautiful. Warm I, but I, you had something to say. I got up to yeah. take pictures because I <laughs> love doing that. That's something I love. Oh, he's still looking at me. Yeah, he's yeah. right there. Uh, How cool. And it's it's neat because we live in a little condo community. It's not like we're off in the woods. We're almost mm. in downtown Princeton. Uh, anyway, that's lovely. No, but I, I was just thinking I couldn't get away during the, the quiet time and the thoughtful time um, on Shabbat. I, I was just thinking positively of what, what I wanted to incorporate or, or continue sort of every day. We've been thinking about that a lot since since the last presidency in the last few years we've already we had already stopped watching we used to watch hours of news at night msnbc would just kind of be on for several hours and we we stopped that because i just uh, i want yeah. to know it all but i just couldn't bear that mm -hmm. um but then I switched it to first thing in the morning, putting on my phone. And I thought about that um, this past weekend. I was, I was thinking about that yesterday. Um, and maybe I really, I didn't do that. And I really liked the all the reading. Down, yeah. Yes, I read almost a whole book in a day, which <laughs> is something I haven't done in a, in a long time. And I like that. And I, but you're I, thinking maybe not doing the news first thing in the morning. And now I'm every, thinking, any day. yes, yeah. now I'm thinking that I'm, yeah, this morning I, I was very reluctant uh, to start off with the, but it was a little bit safer because it was Sunday. <laughs> and there was, it wasn't quite, although yeah. uh, I found some nice things to go to. Uh, and I, And I did that more. But anyway, that's it. And now I'm back to taking pictures and the deer is still just lying there on our back, at the end of our back patio. And that makes me happy. I think he's lying down. Which is he is. He's he's that's lying. amazing. That is so cool. He yeah, was we munching get... on the bush. Yeah. But What's so miraculous about deer in North America is that 75, 100 years ago, there were very, very few deer left. My grandfather told me he hardly ever saw deer in Oklahoma. And now there's deer everywhere. I mean, deer, deer, I mean, it's, and it's really a great recovery. One of, one of, one of the few nice examples of human beings figuring out their folly of their ways. And yeah, uh, hunting limits, having these rules is a good thing. And it's really been remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've had a lot of great conversations today. I really appreciate everyone's engagement today. And I'm hoping we can continue the conversation uh, one thing I was going to suggest just to give the we, we do a fair number of people we know that are watching these uh, classes on record in recorded form as well. So I'm going to post on our the, the Spinoza Haver a Facebook group kind of a thread to try to have more conversation on this topic. And so if you feel comfortable, some things you've shared today, feel free to post it on there. And just because I think it makes it more engaging for the people watching recorded recording to actually be able to join a real conversation and so we can c continue this and also i i don't know about y'all but i really feel a desire to want to grow in my engagement with shabbat and so i it's helpful to talk with others who are in doing this as well so any other last thoughts before we turn off the recorder and we'll we can still have some social time after this for a bit but i do want it anyone has maybe who has not had a chance to talk or has had a burning thought this whole class they haven't been able to share want to give a last minute for that and also martin asked a really good question in the chat i'm just going to uh mention how will people move forward with shabbat practices and so if you want to take a moment to answer that in the chat or uh verbally that would be great too but we'll do that for a couple more minutes then we'll we'll turn off the recorder call it for today i know we'll probably keep building on what we start
I think. I'll find a little bit better recipe. Well, it's not that the recipe was bad for, but I couldn't find the right oh, flour. You also what? Did you also? Oh, I'm sorry. What? No, I'm sorry that, but you also made a wonderful, uh, the matzo. Yeah, I, I made a, a, a mac matzo. and cheese with matzo. I didn't use gluten free pasta for it. I used matzo, and that was kind of nice. That was before the Sabbath, but we made it for the Sabbath. Friday, and it was a Friday cooking. Yeah, yeah. but I think we're going to continue to build on what we what we're doing, what mm -hmm. we've been, what we did this time. I'll just say for myself, I want to keep building too. I uh, actually, this it was before this class that got, got me thinking about this a lot. I was about a month or two back. We had a Spinoza service that uh, dealt with the grief involving war. And it was a meaningful service, but it also, I later got feedback of some folks saying, hey, this is a really heavy subject for Shabbat. And it really got me thinking about how, what subjects do we engage with Shabbat? How do we engage with them on Shabbat? And um, I don't think I have all the answers figured out yet, but what I think I am a lot clearer on is that Shabbat, well, I was I was actually looking at when I was reading Abraham Joshua Heschel's book. He was a very well-known activist, among all of his other things he did, did in life, but he has, his daughter wrote the foreword to the book, and she said, you know, on Shabbat, they did not talk about the Vietnam War. They did not talk about these oppressive things. When the other six days of the week, that was very much a pressing issue. Those issues were, but on Shabbat it wasn't. And so I'm I'm seeking to find, and I'm hoping that, frankly, for purely selfish reasons, I'm hoping it will actually make me a better activist to have a day off. Uh, I think that trying to trying to change the world seven days a week, that's not human. That's not sustainable. So I'm, I'm uh, I guess what I'm going to say is I appreciate this community for kind of sparking some things but it's also then made me want to think more about shabbat more intentionally so i'm wanting to keep exploring there's this interesting you should say that when i was in the military um i kept on active duty i kept um shabbat probably i started keeping shabbat probably most religiously while i was on active duty during desert storm and um we did not discuss the war or anything related to what we were doing on Shabbat. It was like the happiest day of the week. Um, the Chabad, which are very, you know, observant, would come mm -hmm. in on those Fridays and we would dance and we would say, I have the happiest memories mm -hmm. of celebrating Shabbat while I was on active duty during Desert Storm. I mean, we would wow. dance and we would sing and we would, it was the happiest times that I remember, mm -hmm. you know, during the war, actually. Wow. Well, we'll go ahead and turn off the recorder, but we'll keep the chat open for a little bit longer. I have to go at the top of the hour for.